I'd like to welcome you to uh, another uh, lecture in our conversation series. Uh, in, to introduce our speaker is a fellow anthropologist, uh, Provost, Provost Brian Foster. Thanks, Rick. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. This wonderful group today. Um, Dr. Rath's lecture is going to be great, I think. I'm, I'm biased because I'm an anthropologist, as uh, <laughs> Rich said. But um, uh, I think her work is just fascinating. It's really impressive. Uh, has, it's an amazing fit with the culture of our campus. Very interdisciplinary. Um, it would fit with the evolutionary studies, with the One Health, One Medicine, and the Zoo Advantage. Uh, it's, it's just, I think it's, it's a terrific fit for the interdisciplinary spirit of our campus. And I, I think you'll see that throughout. And I say this not just uh, from reading her Vita. This isn't just Vita Smoke. We talked for almost an hour just a little bit ago. And, and I found her to be one of the most energetic and interesting people I've met for a long time. So anyway, Jennifer, wonderful. Anyway, let me say a little bit. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Graff, uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. Um, despite our technological and cognitive abilities, evolutionary forces impact humans as much as any other species on Earth. And our response to such forces emerges from interaction of cultural and bio culture and biology, which is exactly where it comes from. Uh, using the tools of molecular biology to complement uh, the approaches of archaeology and anthropology, Graf studies the genomes of ancient populations to address fundamental questions of how and where they originated and how they have been affected by migration, other populations, and other forces. Pretty complicated stuff. So, really diversifying uh, what they ate and how they survived. So, I want to talk about the effects of contact, European contact, on the health of the Thule people by starting by telling you what uh, Inuit health was like before the Europeans got here. Um, so, what we see in the archaeological record, which is a combination of skeletal remains and also mummies preserved in the ice is that we had incredibly severe trauma, which was uh, affected by the cold. It was very, very cold up there. If you ever get a chance to go, you'll understand what I mean. But we also see a lot of emphysema in the mummies. It's preserved in the lung tissues. They had really serious lung conditions. Because they're, if you think about it, they're living in these, these uh, ice houses, enclosed, all the time, they're not out hunting. They're in these houses. And they're breathing this lamp smoke, which is basically the oil. They're burning oil to breathe it. And so it caused a lot of lung problems for them. They also had a number of infectious diseases, uh, the worst of which we see in the mummies are parasites. Because you think about what they're eating, they're eating um, raw seafood, they're eating raw whale meat, they're eating raw meat in many places. They do, they do cook meat, but um, a good percentage of their diet is actually raw. So they have a really high parasite load. And then they also have nutritional diseases such a vitamin D deficiency, which is, again, unsurprising. You think about, they're living in a climate where a good part of the year, it's, it's total darkness all the time. There's no sunlight. Um, and then they also, surprisingly, have an iron deficiency, which is surprising from what they're eating. They're eating a very heavy meat-based diet. So you would think they would be fine with iron. But in fact, some hypotheses I've seen say that the parasite load was so high on them that they did not, they were not able to absorb enough iron. Um, then we also have starvation being a major problem for them, of course. Um, but they have a low incidence of dental caries, of um, uh, cavities, because they're eating a very low sugar diet. So um, that's what you see before contact. Uh, European contact happened starting in about 1824, with European explorers moving in, um, making contact with the residents of Barrow, Alaska. Uh, commercial whaling began st uh, starting in 1854, um, in the North Slope, and then in 1881, you have the establishment of the first scientific outpost in Barrow, which has been a long tradition, long scientific tradition there. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys, oops, I'm giving it away, <laughs> what do you think uh, would be the effect on Inuit health of this European contact? What patterns of disease you might see changing as a result? And this is a conversation series, so now you have to talk. <laughs> and you can just, just call it out. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more disease that they can be affected by that they've never been exposed to. A lot more disease, yeah. Like, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, can I'm you speculate sure. on that? I know that uh, more south, it was like measles and mumps. Measles and, all and that. mumps, yeah. yeah. And then, I guess, just it you know, can go into the genetics as well if they start managing them. Yeah, okay. 
Good. So more diseases. Excellent. Other other ideas? Well, we know 90% of the population was decimated by smallpox. How did it affect up north? That's a very good question. Um, I'll get to it the next slide. <laughs> other people? So we know smallpox is a major problem, um, at least for Native Americans of the lower 43 and South America. Others? Obesity. Ah, who said that? Yeah. Obesity. Why, why obesity? Um, more sugar in the diet, and then as you move, you know, you're talking 1880s here, so later into the 19th or 20th century, um, what causes foods in the diet. Very good. Did you guys all hear that? Yeah. So we have the introduction of processed foods, more European and Western foods, and obesity becomes a problem. And all the associated conditions with obesity. Okay, good. Anything else? Alcoholism, yes. Um, these people did not have alcohol prior to encounter with Europeans. Um, and if you go to Barrow, in fact, it's, alcohol is very regulated in Barrow. You can only bring so much in, you can't buy it in Barrow. Um, it's a, a reaction to uh, these problems. All right, well, I'll just quickly, you guys basically covered it all, but um, I'll start with actually this, this point. We have, in the 20 and 21st centuries, we've seen a massive increase in the incidence of diabetes, cardiovascular mortality, and other obesity-related uh, issues, it looks like the traditional Inuit diet, you know, goes contrary to what many of us think, a very high-fat, high-protein diet. But it gave them a protective effect, and it was adaptive for their environment. Um, and it's, the protective effect is disappearing, because not only do they have the, uh, uh, Western food is taking increasingly uh, replacing the traditional food, they also have increased sedentism and smoking. Um, occurring. We also see a change in the uh, pattern and extent of traumatic injuries. So whereas before the major cause of traumatic injuries was hunting accidents or cold exposure, now what we see are um, increasing motor vehicle accidents, if that makes sense. We also see an increase in alcohol related injuries uh, severely and interpersonal violence is rising. Probably because of the stress we think, <coughs> maybe in a way of the stress of uh, cultural change and having to uh, adapt to that. The other thing that I want to talk about and call your attention to is, of course, we did have the rise of uh, infectious diseases. They did encounter smallpox. They did encounter uh, tuberculosis. And I'm highlighting that for a reason. That will become clear later. Um, but it was not as bad as farther south. Other Indian groups did not have, it didn't have the same impact. And the reason for that is possibly, it was a relatively short time period before modern medicine began being introduced. They were contacted so late by Europeans that these infectious diseases became a big problem, but we also had uh, modern medicine coming in to treat them much earlier, you know, much earlier relative. So they were exposed to it less. Um, and I think that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch gears before I come back to that idea and talk to you briefly about uh, the culture that was in our own backyard here in uh, Illinois, um, the Mississippian culture, and we're going to contrast uh, Mississippian culture history with the Inuit culture history, um, and what the effect of Native uh, contact with Europeans was here. So um, the Mississippian culture uh, began around 1050 AD at a site called Cahokia. Have any of you guys heard of Cahokia? Oh good, I'm so glad, because Cahokia is this fantastic place. Can you guys, anybody tell me about Cahokia? What, what your experiences are, what do you know about it? Yeah. Um, my family's from Collinsville, um, uh -huh. and the only thing I know is they have like the site of the Cahokia Mountains. Mm -hmm. and See, the mountains is what you have six years on. Yeah, anybody else, any ideas about Cahokia? Okay, so Cahokia is this, uh, there, uh, which is not, you probably can't see it very well, but this is this is modern day site of Cahokia. But in ancient times, it was the largest North American, forgive me archeologists, I'm gonna use the word city. I know that it's loaded, but I'm gonna use it. The largest North American city um, in this whole region. And the Mississippian culture began here. Um, and right here, I don't know if you can see it well, but we have the, the Great Mound, uh, which is now known as Monk's Mound. The base of this mound is larger than the Pyramid of Giza. It's enormous. So everybody needs to go to Cahokia and see it. Uh, it was an incredibly large site. Um, the population in 
1250 AD, about uh, 200 years after its founding, was between 10 and 15,000 people. Oh, yeah. Some people think it's higher than that. Um, and it was double that if you include all of the outlying hinterland communities. To put it in perspective, at this exact same time period, this would have been larger than the entire city of Venice or Milan. Okay, so Cahokia was big. And it appears abruptly, out of nowhere. And this appearance coincides with the medieval war period. So at the same time as you have the Thule racing down the coast, chasing bowhead whales, you have this switch from hunter-gatherer subsistence strategies to intensive maize agriculture. So unlike the Thule, these people were agriculturalists. They were sedentary. They didn't move around. And I am really interested in Cahokia because you see the appearance of these really interesting cultural traits like the, you have a chiefdom now, a very important person, uh, stratified social structures. Some people have much more stuff than other people. They made beautiful artifacts which they would bury. You have human sacrifices going on at Cahokia. Uh, you have um, just these, these enormous mounds being built. And in the hinterland communities surrounding Cahokia, you have these appearance of these Mississippian technologies and potteries and lithics um, about 100 years after Cahokia emerges. But you have them as a smaller scale. There's less social stratification. People are more egalitarian. They're being buried in sort of the same ways as each other. So I was interested in the relationship between this amazing capital city and the smaller community of Schild, which is up the, or, sorry, up the Illinois River from Cahokia, very close together. Possibly, um, questionably, whether they're a Cahokian satellite or not. And at Schild, we have a, a previous culture there called Lake Woodland, uh, which existed between 8,400 and 1,000. And then the Mississippian culture appears shortly after that. And this is a little map, a sketch of the site. Um, we have a bunch of Lake Woodland mounds up on these bluffs here. And then two Mississippian cemeteries, which I've blown up here so you can see where the burials are. And the question is, oops, the question is, when you see this appearance of Mississippian culture, is it the result of people moving into the area? Or are they just sending pots up there? Are people just trading for technologies? Or is there actual genetic change going on? So I looked at this um, with ancient DNA. And uh, what I found was that, indeed, there were, were haplotype discontinuities. So it looks like women were moving into the shield site at this time, this transition. Um, I don't know about men because I wasn't able to get Y chromosome DNA. It's, you know, ancient DNA is difficult. That was not something I could do. But I did get, uh, I can tell you that women were moving into this area. And a genetic, uh, this, and I did a genetic simulation which supported this. Now, I don't know whether or not they were coming from Cahokia. I can't test that without actually looking at Cahokian skeletons. And if you guys know anything about the region of St. Louis, it's very wet. And that's not good for DNA preservation. So I'm not certain that I'll be able to actually test that directly. But it seems like a logical place where they might come. Um, in any case, uh, with all of these caveats, what, how we define an ancient population, small sample size, we do know for sure uh, from these results that there was a lot of movement of people as well as uh, technologies during this time. OK, so I'm going to pose you the same question as I posed it before, but this time free contact Mississippian health. So, Europeans made contact with the Mississippians much earlier than they did um, with the Inuit. And I wanted to ask you what you might expect, given this environment, what kind of health problems you would see among the Mississippians, these ancient farmers, as opposed to the ancient Inuits. Anybody have any ideas how they might have differed from the ancient Inuit? Yeah. Um, probably had less Yes, the corn-based diet, very good. Uh, the dental health was poor. Higher incidence of dental caries. Other ideas? Yeah. Very good. Higher incidence, and that's post-contact. Uh, what about pre-contact? What do you think? What do you think their infectious disease status was pre-contact? Anybody have any ideas? Has anybody read fourteen ninety one? Okay, it's just as well. We'll talk about it. <laughs> okay, so you're absolutely correct. Extremely high rates of dental caries. Their teeth are awful. I mean, they're just, they're painful to look at. 
Um, they had iron deficiency anemia here as well, but for a different purpose, not because they had a high parasite load. We don't actually see that in really diversifying uh, what they ate and how they survived. So I want to talk about the effects of contact, European contact, on the health of the Thule people by starting by telling you what uh, Inuit health was like before the Europeans got here. Um, so what we see in the archaeological record which is a combination of skeletal remains and also mummies preserved in the ice, is that we had incredibly severe trauma, <coughs> which was uh, affected by the cold. It's very, very cold up there. If you ever get a chance to go, you'll understand what I mean. But we also see a lot of emphysema in the mummies. It's preserved in the lung tissues. They had really serious lung conditions because they're, if you think about it, they're living in these, these uh, ice houses, enclosed, all the time, they're not out hunting. They're in these houses, and they're breathing this lamp smoke, which is basically the oil. They're burning oil to breathe it. And so it caused a lot of lung problems for them. They also had a number of infectious diseases, uh, the worst of which we see in the mummies are parasites. Because you think about what they're eating. They're eating um, raw seafood. They're eating raw whale meat. They're eating raw meat in many cases. They do, they do cook meat, but um, a good percentage of their diet is actually raw. So they have a really high parasite load. And then they also have nutritional diseases, such as vitamin D deficiency, which is, again, unsurprising. Think about, they're living in a climate where a good part of the year, it's, it's total darkness all the time. There's no sunlight. Um, and then they also, surprisingly, have iron deficiency, which is surprising given what they're eating. They're eating a very heavy meat-based diet. So you would think they would be fine with iron. But in fact, some hypotheses I've seen say that the parasite level was so high on them that they did not, they were not able to absorb enough iron. Um, then we also have starvation being a major problem for them, of course. Um, but they have a low incidence of dental caries, of um, uh, cavities, because they're eating a very low sugar diet. So uh, that's what you see before contact. Uh, European contact happened starting in about 1824 with European explorers moving in, um, making contact with the residents of Barrow, Alaska. Uh, commercial whaling began st uh, starting in 1854 um, in the North Slope, and then in 1881, you have the establishment of the first scientific outpost in Barrow, which has been a long tradition, long scientific tradition there. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys, oops, I'm giving it away, <laughs> what do you think uh, would be the effect on Inuit health of this European contact? What patterns of disease might seem changing as a result? And this is a conversation series, so now you have to talk. <laughs> and you're going to just, just call it out. Yeah. Or a lot more disease that they could be affected by that they've never been exposed to. A lot more disease, yeah. Like, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, Can I'm you speculate sure. on that? I know that um, more south, it was like measles and mumps. Measles and, all and mumps, that. yeah. yeah. And then, I guess, just in, that can go into the genetics as well if they start mating. Yeah. yeah, okay. Good. So more diseases. Excellent. Other, other ideas? Well, we know 90% of the population was decimated by smallpox. How would it affect up north? That's a very good question. Um, I'll get to it in the next slide. <laughs> Other people, so we know smallpox is a major problem, um, at least for Native Americans of the lower 40 and South America. Others? Obesity. Ah, who said that? Yeah. Obesity. Why, why obesity? Um, more sugar in the diet, and then as you move, you know, Very good. Did you guys all hear that? Yeah. So we have the introduction of processed foods, more European and Western foods, and obesity becomes a problem. And all the associated conditions with obesity. Okay, good. Anything else? Alcoholism. Alcoholism, yes. Um, these people did not have alcohol prior to encounter with Europeans. Um, and if you go to Barrow, in fact, it's alcohol is very regulated in Barrow. You can only bring so much in, you can't buy it. In a reaction to these problems. All right, well, I'll just quickly, you guys basically covered it all, but um, I'll start with actually this, this point. We have, in the 20 and 21st centuries, we've seen a massive increase in the incidence of diabetes, cardiovascular mortality, and other obesity-related uh, issues. It looks like the traditional Inuit diet, you know, goes contrary to what many of us think, a very high-fat, high-protein diet. But it gave them a protective effect, and it was adaptive for their environment. 
Um, and it's, the protective effect is disappearing because not only do they have the, um, uh, Western food is taking increasingly uh, replacing the traditional food, they also have increased sedentism and smoking um, occurring. We also see a change in the uh, pattern and extent of traumatic injuries. So whereas before the major cause of traumatic injuries was hunting accidents or cold exposure, now what we see are um, increasing motor vehicle accidents, if that makes sense. We also see an increase in alcohol-related injuries uh, severely, and interpersonal violence is rising. Probably because of the stress, we think, <coughs> maybe in a way, maybe the stress of uh, cultural change and having to uh, adapt to that. The other thing that I want to talk about and call your attention to is, of course, we did have the rise of uh, infectious diseases. They did encounter smallpox. They did encounter uh, tuberculosis. And I'm highlighting that for a reason. That will become clear later. Um, but it was not as bad as farther south. Other Indian groups did not have, it didn't have the same impact. And the reason for that is possibly it was a relatively short time period before modern medicine began being introduced. They were contacted so late by Europeans that these infectious diseases became a big problem, but we also had uh, modern medicine coming in to treat them much earlier, you know, much earlier relative. So they were exposed to it less. Um, and I think that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch gears before I come back to that idea and talk to you briefly about uh, the culture that was in our own backyard here in uh, Illinois, um, the Mississippian culture. And we're going to contrast uh, Mississippian culture history with the Inuit culture history um, and what the effect of Native of contact with Europeans was here. So um, the Mississippian culture uh, began around 1050 AD at a site called Cahokia. Have any of you guys heard of Cahokia? Oh good, I'm so glad, because Cahokia is this fantastic place. Can you guys, anybody tell me about Cahokia? What, what your experiences are? What do you know about it? Yeah. Um, my family's from Collinsville. Um, uh -huh. You know, the only thing I know is they have like, the site of the Cahokia Mountains. Mm -hmm. like, See, the mountains is what you've sticks in your mind. Yeah, anybody else, any ideas about Cahokia? Okay, so Cahokia is this, uh, there, uh, which is not, you probably can't see it very well, but this is this is modern day site of Cahokia. But in ancient times, it was the largest North American, forgive me archaeologists, I'm going to use the word city. I know that it's loaded, but I'm going to use it. The largest North American city um, in this whole region. And the Mississippian culture began here. Um, and right here, I don't know if you can see it well, but we have the, the Great Mound, uh, which is now known as Monk's Mound. The base of this mound is larger than the Pyramid of Giza. It's enormous. So everybody needs to go to Cahokia and see it. Uh, it was an incredibly large site. Um, the population in 1250 AD, about uh, 200 years after its founding, was between 10 and 15,000 people. Oh, yeah. Some people think it's higher than that. Um, and it was double that if you include all of the outlying hinterland communities. To put it in perspective, at this exact same time period, this would have been larger than the entire city of Venice or Milan, okay, so Cahokia was big. And it appears abruptly, out of nowhere, and this appearance coincides with the medieval warm period. So at the same time as you have the Thule racing down the coast, chasing bowhead whales, you have this switch from hunter-gatherer subsistence strategies to intensive maize agriculture. So unlike the Thule, these people were agriculturalists, they were sedentary, they didn't move around. And I am really interested in Cahokia because you see the appearance of these really interesting cultural traits like the, you have a chiefdom now, a very important person, uh, stratified social structures. Some people have much more stuff than other people. They made beautiful artifacts which they would bury. You have human sacrifices going on at Cahokia. Uh, you have um, just these, these enormous valleys being built. And in the hinterland communities surrounding Cahokia, you have these appearance of these Mississippian technologies and potteries and lithics um, about 100 years after Cahokia emerges. But you have them as a smaller scale. There's less social stratification. People are more egalitarian. They're being buried in sort of the same ways as each other. 
So I was interested in the relationship between this amazing capital city and the smaller community of Schilf, which is up the, or, sorry, up the Illinois River from Cahokia, very close together, possibly, um, questionably, whether they're a Cahokian satellite or not. And at Schilf, we have a, a previous culture there called Lake Woodland, uh, which existed between 8,400 and 1,000. And then the Mississippian culture appears shortly after that. And this is a little map, a sketch of the site. Um, we have a bunch of late woodland mounds up on these bluffs here, and then two Mississippian cemeteries, which I've blown up here so you can see where the burials are. And the question is, oops, excuse me. The question is, when you see this appearance of Mississippian culture, is it the result of people moving into the area, or are they just sending pots up there, people just trading for technologies, or is there actual genetic change going on? So I looked at this um, with ancient DNA, and uh, what I found was that indeed there were, were haplotype discontinuities. So it looks like women were moving into the shield site at this time, this transition. Um, we, I don't know about men because I wasn't able to get Y chromosome DNA. It's, you know, HIV is difficult. That was not something I could do. But I did get, uh, I can tell you that women were moving into this area. And a genetic, uh, this, and I did a genetic simulation which supported this. Now, I don't know whether or not they were coming from Cahokia. I can't test that without actually looking at Cahokian skeletons. And if you guys know anything about the region of St. Louis, it's very wet, and that's not good for DNA preservation. So I'm not certain that I'll be able to actually test that directly. But it seems like a logical place where they might come. Um, in any case, uh, with all of these caveats, what, how we define an ancient population in small sample size, we do know for sure uh, from these results that there was a lot of movement of people as well as uh, technologies during this time. Okay, so I'm going to pose you the same question as I posed before, but this time pre-contact Mississippian health. So Europeans made contact with the Mississippians much earlier than they did uh, with the Inuit. And I wanted to ask you what you might expect given this environment, what kind of health problems you would see among the Mississippians, these ancient farmers. Of those ancient Inuits. Anybody have any ideas how they might have differed from the ancient Inuit? Yeah. Um, probably had like less dental Yes, the corn based diet, very good. Uh, the dental health was poor, higher incidence of dental caries. Other ideas? And that's post-contact, though. What about pre-contact? What do you think? What do you think their infectious disease status was pre-contact? Anybody have any ideas? Has anybody read 1491? Okay, it's just this one. We'll talk about it. <laughs> okay, so you're absolutely correct. Extremely high rates of dental caries. Their teeth are awful. I mean, they're just they're painful to look at. Um, they had iron deficiency anemia here as well, but for a different purpose. Not because they had a high parasite load. We don't actually see that in skeletons. It's because they're eating corn. All their, not all, but the vast majority of their diet is corn. Um, we don't see starvation as, an, as much of an issue as it is in the Arctic. Um, you know, there's plenty of food resources here in the Midwest that you can get at, and it's not cold and not difficult to go out and hunt um, as it is there. But this is the interesting thing, and this kind of goes counterintuitive to what I think a lot of our ideas about Native American history are. That we, have, we do have high rates of some infectious diseases. In particular, we have high rates of tuberculosis. Okay, so I mentioned tuberculosis briefly earlier with the Inuits and how it affected them post-contact. Here, we have the presence of tuberculosis prior to European contact. And that's a bit of a surprising finding. This is an example of an individual who had tuberculosis at the shield site. This is what tuberculosis does to your bones if you have it, a bone tuberculosis infection. This is called Potts disease, and it's a characteristic fusing and then collapsing of the uh, vertebrae, or excuse me, collapsing and fusing of the vertebrae. Um, and you get this characteristic uh, shape in your vertebrae. It's very painful, so people with it are, are bent over like this. We find this and other tuberculosis-related lesions in the Shill site and in other Mississippian um, sites, and actually in the Southwest as well. And they're very common. And this is a bit of a puzzle because the standard wisdom is that Europeans 
came and they brought smallpox and they brought all these infectious diseases and tuberculosis was one of them. And they decimated uh, American populations with these diseases. But it's surprising to find that this particular disease, at least skeletally, seems to be here already. So this is the sort of thing that you can test with ancient DNA. It's a very good application of anthropological genetics. We can get TB DNA, and we have gotten TB DNA from these pre-contact populations. Um, and one of the things that I did with my dissertation was to look at the SHIELD site and say, OK, we know that TB was present. How frequent was it? What was the incidence of it? There are some issues with determining what a negative result means. Is it just DNA is not being preserved, or is the person actually not infected? But what I found, I tested that taking that into consideration, I took, I tested over 144 individuals at this site. I got DNA from them. And uh, I, oops, I was able to uh, isolate a TB from 5.6% of them. Um, and anybody in here who's a medical person will tell you that that's a pretty high rate of infection in the population. So I think that's really interesting. And to take it one step further, you ask, yes, do you want you use the word all. Are you talking about all eight, or are you talking about all 144 individuals tested? Oh, I'm sorry. Eight individuals of 144 were infected. Right. So exactly. underneath that, it says all individuals had TB lesions. Oh, excuse me. Yes, all of the people with TB had TB lesions. Okay. And that gets to another issue, which I wasn't necessarily going to bring up, but I think since you brought it up, That's I want to talk about it. If we have time, I hope we have time. Uh, the TB infection pattern in the bones was different than what we see in other populations, that we see in European populations. The skeletal, the rate of skeletal involvement is high, and the pattern is slightly different. We get a lot more rib lesions um, than we would have expected. I don't know what it means, but I'm very intrigued by it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a good point. It, and I should, I guess, contrast it with some work that a friend of mine has done who's actually gotten TB from individuals who don't have lesions. So it is possible to get TB DNA from non-lesions. Okay, so taking that one step further, then we want to ask, about what is the phylogenetic relationship of ancient American tuberculosis to modern tuberculosis? Are they related in any way? This is really hard to get at because, again, when you get DNA from bacteria, you've got to really convince yourself, is it actual TB, ancient TB DNA, or is it a modern bacterial contaminant? So we have very stringent uh, requirements in how we assess whether or not it was ancient tuberculosis. Um, and in fact, we had a lot of genetic data that we could not convince ourselves was actually not contaminant. But what we found from this particular gene, gyrase B, um, we were able to sequence part, a good chunk of it, and what we found was that our ancient tuberculosis samples fell out. Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree that we made. Um, our ancient samples fell out based on sequence uh, outside of the modern tuberculosis complex. They look different than all tuberculosis that we have sequenced today. It makes sense phylogenetically because if this TB was evolving on the American continent for you know, 15,000 years, it's possible that it would look very different from um, uh, TB or African TB. But what's interesting is that from this, we can't tell right now whether or not it was a human-mediated infection or whether it was a zoonotic transmission. Did people catch TB from American wildlife uh, in proximity to, say, bison or some of the megafauna? Or did they bring it with them when they originally came? We don't know. We can't tell from the sequence yet. I know that there is a project ongoing, I'm not working on it, but somebody else is working on it, to sequence the entire genome of the ancient tuberculosis bacteria. So if they are successful, Stan, keep, keep an eye out for that, the results of that. It would be very interesting to see what they have to say. But in any case, it looks like modern uh, TB may be outcompeted the ancient tuberculosis. We're not sure. Okay. So. As I said, European contact, and as you probably know already, European contact occurred um, early relative to the Inuit. So we have uh, DeSoto's expeditions uh, contacting the Mississippians. At this point, they had left Cahokia and they moved down south. Their uh, populations were moving all over the place. Um, Cahokia had been abandoned by, by, by this point. But in, uh, there were definitely still Mississippians uh, in the south, uh, southeastern United States. They were contacted by uh, DeSoto and uh, between 15, 1539 and 1543, and he introduced European pathogens to them. 
And as you are probably aware, that, that at this point they became infected with smallpox, influenza, measles, and a whole host of other diseases, including tuberculosis. It was actually introduced to them. What I've been interested in looking at is whether their experience of tuberculosis was milder, whether there's some kind of protective effect um, based on uh, already, already exposed, being already exposed to this. But I have not been able to actually get a lot of historical information. So this is something that's still ongoing. Uh, syphilis was also interesting. Um, and if you're interested in the history of syphilis, I will talk after because it's, it's a fun, fun story to talk about. <laughs> OK, so that was the disease consequence of contact with Europeans. What were the social consequences? I'm going to ask you this another opportunity to talk about. Anybody want to speculate? Yes. So, any disruption in family units or mm -hmm. um, marriage or divorce patterns? Like there was, yes. In fact, we had depopulation of this entire region. There was voluntary and forced resettlements of Native Americans. You, you probably know this history from American history. The Mississippi and entire Mississippi of political and religious systems collapsed following the introduction of these diseases. Whether it's cause, causation, you know, it's hard to say whether maybe there were other people contributing factors, but we know for sure that Mississippi and political and religious systems collapsed uh, very close to following the European contact, or at least European contact. Today, we do not know who the descendants of the Mississippians are. We don't know who their population, there are many different candidate tribes, but we don't have a clear linkage between a modern tribe and these peoples. Um, it's something that genetics can possibly address in the future. Um, if these individuals are interested in uh, doing that kind of work, uh, but it's you know, entirely up to them. So I want to bring it back to the Arctic a bit and talk about, uh, in the future, obviously, the Arctic peoples are experiencing climate change right now. Um, you all are hearing about the, the plight of the polar bear, the um, melting of the ice, um, temperatures are rising, and in the Arctic, they are aware of this. Uh, if you go and talk to anybody in Barrow, they'll tell you, they can tell you in great detail how the climate has changed from um, earlier times. And it's been always something that people are very worried about this. Um, however, this climate change, the adaptation to climate change, I think, might be impacted by the fact that the Inuits have occupied this region for over four, uh, 800 years, continuously. There's genetic and cultural continuity there so that they have a very uh, strong store of traditional knowledge about the land and about adaptations. And in fact, as we talked about at the very beginning of the talk, they've already experienced climate change in their prehistory um, and demonstrated resilience to it. So I'm hopeful, and maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I'm hopeful that uh, a combination of uh, this association, this continuity with uh, this region, and also their strong social networks, which are very, very strong, might improve their adaptive capacity and make them resilient to environmental change. And finally, I'm going to leave you with a few conversation topics to ask you about what the social determinants of health were for the Arctic peoples versus the Mississippians. And I'll leave you with this question, are all Native Americans the same? And can you design a health intervention for Native Americans, a single <coughs> approach? <laughs> and I want to thank everybody <laughs> who's helped me with this research, and it's quite a long list. Um, so I'm going to leave you with those discussion questions. And, uh, so do you have any questions? Yes, Jack. Um, you know, I, you know how you said that this that all the Native Americans came from this very you know relatively small region of of Siberia and came over here. So can you explain why? Um, the importance of that in terms of why it is an interesting group of individuals to work with and to examine, do, do you mean as yeah. opposed to other, uh, other racial ethnic groups? That's a really great, great question because the answer to that is it's a subset of a subset, it's a very small founding population that then dispersed and settled throughout the Americas a very wide range of territories and of environmental conditions and developed so many different adaptations um, given a relatively 
homogenous genetic background. And so it's sort of a simplified case compared to the rest of the world. And we still have so many questions about how this has happened. Um, so I, I think that, does that answer yes, the question? Yes, right, okay. yeah. right. I think that's so, just so interesting and so important mm -hmm. to consider. And then we also, not to mention, have this experience of contact with Europeans decimation of populations in some regions but not others. And, um, and these adaptations that have occurred since then. Do you have an idea of the pressures that forced the initial people out of that region? Out of Siberia? Yeah. No. I mean, it may have just been that they were exploiting new territory. Uh, an older model suggests, the Clovis first model, which is problematic, suggests that they were chasing megafauna, like these big uh, mammoths, and they were chasing their hunters, and they were chasing them across the landscape. Um, I think genetically there's not a lot of support for that. But it may simply be that they were exploring and, and testing new material, uh, new uh, territory. Yes. This might not have an answer, but uh, so like we as Americans, uh, there's you know a lot of us are asking, well, are we part Native American? Uh -huh. That whole thing. Um, earlier in the presentation, you showed that theoretically that the people uh, like the Thule went all the way to Greenland and mm -hmm. came back and you know had a whole strip of migration. Um, so, kind of go back to me wanting to figure out if we're part of the are there green leaders that may have some uh, relation to the Thule? Yes, that? we definitely have modern Inuits living in Greenland, in Greenland uh, who are descendants of those initial colonizers. We don't have necessarily Paleo Eskimos living there, though. Again, we have this complete genetic break. The earliest inhabitants of the Arctic and the modern habits of the Arctic, they're not the same genetically, which is interesting. But yeah, definitely there are modern Inuits. I have one more. That's what I don't understand, though. There's, if they all come from a particular pool, mm -hmm. right? And they all follow this migration pattern, right? Yeah. Then what explains the genetic break between the Paleo Eskimos and the Thule's? We don't have an answer for that. We don't. Now, okay, there are a couple possibilities. Maybe they just took over their land somehow, and they, or maybe they interbred. And again, we're looking mostly at mitochondrial DNA for this part of the study. We haven't done the Y chromosomes yet, so stay tuned for that part. We're looking at the movement of women. So perhaps the movement of women and the movement of men left different patterns. Mm. We certainly see different patterns with contact with Europeans. But I'm speculating here until we actually do the Y chromosomes or not. What about <coughs> disagreements, war? Did these people get along well or did they fight? In, I'll tell you, in the Midwest, they fought a lot. There was a lot of warfare. In the Arctic, we don't know because we don't have a lot of paleo Eskimo skeletons to look at. <laughs> um, we do know that there was violence. Definitely, there's definite evidence of violence, violent trauma. Um, but as far as rates go, uh, I don't think it was as severe as it was, say, in the Aleutian Islands, where we have a lot of violence going on, or in the uh, uh, farther south. But it's certainly warfare could be an explanation for it. OK, I think we're reaching Thank you almost so 1 o'clock. That correct will stay. If you have any questions you can, choose, you can visit for a little while. But let's all thank her, and it's been a great time.